Hello once again, everybody, and thank you for joining me in the Betters Box. It's bangthebook.com's MLB betting podcast for Monday, April 29th. I am your host, Adam Burke. This and every edition of the Betters Box presented by our friends over at DSI Sportsbook. BTB and the number 200 is that promo code. 100% deposit match bonus for the Sportsbook up to $500. 100% deposit match bonus for the live casino up to $500. At BetDSI, it's only a game until you bet it. As you know, we've got the Monday-Thursday format here with the Betters Box. Today being Monday, we will have another edition of the Monday Mailbag. You can reach out to me with your questions at Skating Tripods on Twitter or adam at bangthebook.com via email. Also, adam at bangthebook.com via email. If you want to sign up for the notes, get on the mailing list here for the Betters Box. Don't forget about my daily picks and tips piece over at bangthebook.com. And also over at the website right now, Great NBA series previews for the second round. Parker Michaels off to an outstanding start here in the second round with his NHL picks. Make sure you're checking that out on a daily basis. I'll have golf stuff for you today for the Wells Fargo Championship. We'll talk Kentucky Derby this week with Brian Blessing on either Tuesday or Wednesday. I'll see which day works best for him. Uh, But then I'll also have my written previews over at bangthebook.com with the Kentucky Oaks three-year-old Philly race and the Kentucky Derby here. Really looking forward to digging into the stuff that's going on this weekend at Churchill Downs. So that'll be posted at bangthebook.com. Also NASCAR this week. Uh, We got a lot of stuff going on right now. Still a very, very busy time of year. So keep it tuned to bangthebook.com where we are your one-stop shop for sports betting news and information. As you know, the Monday mailbag here today, as I just mentioned, well, then we'll go beyond the box score, take a look down the lines, give you a pick for tonight's action and then preview the week ahead. So let's go ahead and dive in with the Monday mailbag. And again, at Skating Tripods on Twitter or Adam at bangthebook.com via email to submit your questions for the mailbag. We'll start with something very, very easy. Here's our good buddy, Rich Lamons, sending one baseball question and one fun question to find out a little bit more about me. We'll start with that fun question here, asking what's your favorite non-domesticated animal and why? And this one's pretty easy for me. I think snow leopards are absolutely adorable. They are my favorite non-domesticated animal. Uh, They're sleek, but they're also adorably cute, kind of solitary, which I can be a lot of times as well. So I guess it just sort of fits with me. They're also very elusive. You don't see them a whole lot. Not to say that I'm some kind of shut-in or anything like that, but, uh, you know, with this job, with working from home, being in my office all the time, you know, I don't know, sort of feel a kinship, I guess, uh, with snow leopards. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it was wolves when I was a kid. It's snow leopards now. Um, hey, whatever. It's just a pretty cool thing. And by the way, if you ever get a chance to check out any of the Planet Earths on Netflix, uh, they are fantastic. I'm kind of an animal lover. Uh, I always have been. My wife and I, in fact, have the entire set of Animorphs books for anybody out there that read those as a kid. The only one we're missing is number one because she lent it to somebody to borrow. They never returned it. All of them with the original covers, too. Uh, so just a random little note about me there, but I am kind of an animal lover, a bit of a softy. Uh, when it comes to our four-legged friends or our third friends that are out there uh, in the world. But getting back to baseball here, Richard asking me, what are your thoughts on the sacrifice bunt? And this came about because the Astros did it in the sixth inning yesterday. I'll get to that in a second. But as a general rule, I hate sacrifice bunts. Bunting is almost never the right tactical decision. Now, sometimes they will increase your chances of scoring one run, but what they'll do is they'll decrease your chances of scoring multiple runs because you're actively giving up and out. Therefore, in my estimation, I the only time to bunt is when you legitimately need one run. So it would be a late game situation. I would never, outside of pitchers hitting, of course, advocate a bunt before the eighth inning. And really right now, with the juiced balls and with the relative level of success that pitchers are having this year, I'd, I'm more apt to just let them swing away too. But a lot of times a bunt will decrease your win expectancy or it will have a very nominal impact on your chances of winning the game before the eighth inning. So the only time I would ever bunt with any position player would be after the eighth. It would be the eighth inning or later when you really only need one run in a lot of those instances, especially if you're playing for you know the go-ahead run. Well, we've seen a lot of bullpen meltdowns this season as well. So you know, I just think it's sacrifice bunting. I, I just don't see a place for it really in today's game. And when you look at it with regards to the sixth inning last night for the Astros, Robinson Chirinos draws a leadoff walk. In a one nothing game, They uh, the Astros were trailing one nothing. 
They have a 44.7% win expectancy with Chirinos on first and nobody out. Again, they're trailing one nothing. Tony Kemp puts down a sacrifice bunt. The win expectancy, this is all according to fan graphs, falls to 41.8%. So that bunt decreased Houston's chances of winning by almost 3%. So again, a lot of times, mathematically, from a game theory standpoint, sacrifice bunting is the wrong decision. It's one of those things where managers can have a pretty big impact on the game. I don't like managers that believe in the sacrifice bunt. It's one of the things I don't like about Terry Francona specifically. But when you look at this situation here in particular, a run there only ties the game. You're better off swinging away if you're Tony Kemp. And furthermore, he bunted the catcher into scoring position where one hit may not do the job. You may need two hits to drive the catcher in. And in this current environment for Major League Baseball, where teams are not stringing hits together, a lot of times it's a home run or walks or something like that, I think it's a really bad spot to bunt the catcher into scoring position. If we look at actual data, this comes from baseball prospectus, from the 2019 season here so far, which is now a month old after yesterday's games went in the books, with a runner on first and nobody out, that run scores 44.06% of the time. With a runner on second and one out, that run scores 41.4% of the time. So if you've got a runner on first with nobody out and you bunt him to second base, you are decreasing your run expectancy in that situation. Your expected value of scoring one run goes down. I would never bunt anybody from first to second, not in today's strikeout heavy lead. Now, if you have a runner on second with nobody out, that run will score 58.73% of the time. If you bunt that run to third, so you have a runner on third with one out, that run scores 60.16% of the time. So that runs that runner is already going to score 58.7% of the time. You bunt him over to third, you only increase your chances by less than one and a half percent of scoring that run up to 60.16%. And that's because it's such a strikeout heavy league. So overall, bunting, which was already decreasing in importance, has really taken a nosedive here over the last few seasons. Let's look at this for, let's try this on for size here. If you've got a runner on first with nobody out, your expected number of runs is 0.9268. If you have a runner on second with one out, your expected number of runs is 0.5775. If you have a runner on second with nobody out, your expected number of runs is 1.1319. If you've got a runner on third with one out, your expected number of runs, 0.9164. So in this current run environment, Major League Baseball, more often than not, a sacrifice bunt won't help you that much in terms of scoring one run and will decrease your expectancy of scoring multiple runs, which, again, is not the objective. The objective is to score as many runs as possible. So more often than not, bunting is a very, 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 very bad decision. Again, anytime eighth inning or later, when you need one run, either it's to put yourself in front or you know maybe tie the game, something like that, by bunting a guy from second to third, I would almost never bunt from first to second because when you think about it, You bunt from first to second, especially if you've got a left-handed hitter at the plate, you give up that hole on the left side of the infield because that guy's holding that runner on at first. He doesn't want that runner to steal to get into scoring position. You bunt him over to second, well, you don't have that spot anymore on the the right side of the infield. So a lot of situations where bunting just doesn't make any sense, I think it's a stupid tactical decision. I don't think it makes sense at all, really, to do it from first to second. I don't think it makes any sense whatsoever to do it before the eighth inning. So those are my thoughts on sacrifice bunting. Clark via email asking, at what point or at what odds do you think it's worth taking the run line? Regarding the Twins tonight, you can get them at plus one and a half around minus 110. I think if you get any underdog plus one and a half at plus money, I think that's a pretty decent look here. We had 668 one-run games last year. So 27.5% of the games from last regular season were decided by one run. The favorites did win 371 of those games. So underdogs did pretty well in one-run games as well. Underdogs overall won 881 games last season. The run line was 54.9% for the favorite, but an average line of minus 140. So that was well below the break-even percentage that you would need 
in order to make money at 54.9%. So I'm not sure overall how all of the math checks out. It's something I haven't done a complete deep dive in. If you want to correlate it to the total where you've got, you know, plus one and a half at plus money or minus 105, minus 110 with a total of seven or seven and a half, obviously that makes some sense because the expectation of a low scoring game would theoretically bring that plus one and a half into play more often. But I do think the plus one and a half at plus money with, you know, decent teams is a good look more often than not. Here in this case tonight, I actually do like the Twins straight up on the money line, but at plus one and a half minus 110 is not a bad idea here in this situation. I don't really have a set point necessarily, but again, 27% of games are going to be one run games in an average season. And you're going to have underdogs winning those plus one and a half anyway. So I think there can be some value to it. Obviously I wouldn't spray it around the board all the time, uh, but you know, the game is sort of predicated on underdogs having a chance and a lot of one run games. So I do think that there can be some spot opportunities to do it. And maybe tonight with the twins uh, could be one as well. Mark via email here with some very kind words, noting that, you know, he watched action on Showtime and, uh, you know, mentioned Vegas Dave and, and some of the other people that are out there in this industry, you know, that, uh, that do pick selling and, and don't give out nearly the information that I do uh, for free over at bangthebook.com. So Mark gave me some props and some thanks for that. So Mark, I really appreciate that. He says, let me tap into that free keg of knowledge for your thoughts and insights on first inning betting. Do you see any edges to take advantage of? And this is a really interesting question. I had to do a lot of digging uh, back to last season when I talked about these things because I noticed that dating back to 2009, the first inning was the highest scoring inning. And that, those were from the notes I talked about last year on April 12th, that dating back to 2009, the first inning had been the highest scoring inning. So a lot of people do like to bet those yes or no first inning props. When you look at this season, the first inning of the first nine innings of a game actually ranks sixth in number of runs scored. The game is changing quite a bit, in particular with the opener concept, which obviously Tampa Bay has implemented a lot. And just for whatever reason here, teams just not doing as much damage in the first inning. This year, in terms of run scoring by inning, it's the third inning, the seventh inning, the eighth inning, the sixth, the fourth, the first, the fifth, the second, and the ninth, which is really interesting to me. The third inning makes sense because that's when a starter turns the lineup over for the second time. A lot of times we've seen the third and fourth innings be very high scoring. Also the fifth and sixth innings, the fifth inning, not high scoring at all here, which implies to me that this season we're seeing a lot more aggressiveness from managers pulling starters out of the fifth inning in order to get those relievers out there. So this is a clear cut sign of how the game is changing. What's also interesting to me is that the seventh and the eighth innings are the second and third highest scoring innings this season. So bullpens are not performing well this year. That's definitely had an impact on me in a couple of different areas with money line plays. I've been playing a lot more first fives this year. Um, and obviously, you know, if the bullpens aren't getting the job done, that's going to increase scoring in the late innings, which is going to push some games over the total as well. So I'm not really sure how to handle the first inning here this year. Again, it's sixth in run scoring and also sixth in number of home runs. Last year on April 12th, when I discussed this, there were 27, excuse me, 37 more first inning runs than any other inning. There were 227 first inning runs as of April 12th. This year, we've got 429 first inning runs as of April 29th. So first inning scoring is down. It has not been as great of an impact, uh, which is very, very interesting to me. So, Mark, I'm glad you asked this question. And, again, also seeing it the sixth, seventh, and eighth innings are in the top four of run scoring innings. The sixth makes sense with pitchers turning the lineup over a third time or in some instances a fourth time. But the seventh and eighth inning just shows how poorly bullpens have pitched here so far this season, which is something that uh, – I'm not really sure what adjustment I can make from a betting standpoint, but it is extremely interesting to say the least. And by the way, of course, as we see here, you know, uh, the fourth and the sixth innings that times through the order penalty can be a good live betting opportunity for you out there. Uh, also, Mark adding here, do you think that some of the ERA FIP XFIP line moves have moved more to the first five market rather than the full game? I certainly think that's the case, but I also think that we're probably not seeing as many of those moves because we're seeing a greater reluctance to go off of last season's statistics. 
a lot of pitchers adding pitches, subtracting pitches, changing their pitch usage, stuff like that. I think that maybe the previous season's data just doesn't hold nearly as much water uh, as it has in past years with guys making adjustments and stuff like that. So I think as we get increased sample sizes here, we'll see those ERA, FIP, and XFIP moves come back around in the months of May and June. We've got a little bit less arbitrage, a little more you know, people taking positions to look to fade guys as sample sizes get larger. So that is something I would expect to see here over the next several weeks as we get starters that have thrown 30, 40, 50 innings, stuff like that, where we've got maybe a little bit better of an idea on what they have to bring to the table. Brian via email asks here, seems hockey players are known to be pretty superstitious. Do you have any betting superstitions? Uh, And as a follow-up, what are some of the weirdest and funniest superstitions you've ever heard in sports or life in general? I don't have a ton of superstitions. I mean, I I mentioned this in my write-up a few weeks ago that, uh, you know, back in 2007 when the Indians were making their playoff run and I was in college, I'd shave after losses, sort of, you know, wipe the slate slate clean, uh, something like that. Really, the only thing I'll do is, you know, if I have a good day, like Friday, I had a good day going 3-0, and I'll listen to the same artist or album on Spotify that day when I'm writing the article. I always have music playing when I'm working. It's just background noise more often than not. Always have some kind of artist playing on my computer. Uh, so if I have a good day, you know, I'll start the day with that artist again. Um, though, as far as that, you know, weirdest superstitions I've heard or seen, you know, Wade Boggs eating chicken before every game. Uh, Wayne Gretzky used to put baby powder on his stick saying, you know, you got to take care of the things you love, stuff like that. Nothing outlandish or out of the ordinary, but I know that there are a lot of quirky guys that are out there. Uh, you know, a lot of times like pitchers won't sign autographs days that they pitch, stuff like that. Um, you know, just different things. I don't have any personally, and I haven't heard or seen too many from friends of mine, but uh, obviously you no, know, there are plenty out there and I'm sure Google search uh, will yield a lot of different things. A couple more questions here for the Monday mailbag. Uh, these two from Chainsaw via email says, what's your take on the hot hand debate? And obviously the hot hand debate would be, you know, a handicapper is hot. That's when it's a good time to buy in. Some people believe when a handicapper is cold, it's a good time to buy in because things are going to change. So I think from a confidence standpoint, it can matter a little bit. I think it's more of a subconscious type of thing because I've gotten off to a very, very bad start to this baseball season with my picks and tips article. And it's been, exceptionally frustrating. It's been maddening. It's really weighed on me a lot mentally, physically, and emotionally here this year. Um, And it's one of those things where, you know, I write up the article, I list the pick, I post it, and I have a sick feeling in the pit of my stomach just wondering, how is this pick going to lose? I think a lot of times you talk about like shooters with a heat check, you know, something like that. If they're hot and they're feeling it, they're not thinking about anything. You know, they're just shooting. They're not tensed up thinking, how am I going to miss this shot? Their focus isn't somewhere else. Their focus is just, you know, the, the muscle memory is going through what they know works for them. So I think in that regard, maybe the hot hand bait debate does kind of stand out, maybe in more of a subconscious type of way where you're just doing what feels natural. You're just doing what feels normal as opposed to, you know, just thinking the worst, wondering, you know, how is this going to go wrong this time? You know, and and that is something that I've kind of struggled with here a little bit. And that sort of leads to Chainsaw's follow-up question here of, you know, during the brutal stretch to begin the baseball season, which every gambler has at some point, what were some of the words of wisdom or advice given to you by your peers uh, who've been doing this for a long time? And, you know, I talked to Parker Michaels about it, our NHL guy over at bangthebook.com. And he was like, look, you know, I know that you're tracking for the first time publicly this year. And he goes, don't look at that. Don't look at the results. He even offered tabulate the results for me you know because a lot of times you start worrying about the results you start getting obsessed about that and it may cause you to chase or it may cause you to widen your requirements for what makes the cut at that point if you're being a little bit irresponsible with your handicapping you may end up digging the hole deeper and you may end up hurting yourself even more so he you know just sort of advised me to you know stick with the process that i know has worked for me you know it's early season variants if you If you believe in your process, if you make the right adjustments, those results will come back. If you dwell on them, well, you you, you may do some things that hurt you even more in the long term. And that was some advice that was really, really helpful to me. I'm still tabulating the spreadsheet myself despite his, uh, you know, his offer. But, you know, I agree. I mean, it's one of those things where if you're just looking at the results, you think about it, you start pressing. 
you know, if you're a hitter and you're two for 30, two for your last 34, you start pressing. You're gripping the bat a little bit tighter. You know, nothing feels natural. You don't have any confidence up there in the batter's box or in the batter's box, excuse me. And that's been a thing for me here where I've had very little confidence. And like I said, it has weighed on me emotionally. It has weighed on me physically. It has weighed on me mentally. And it's been a real struggle because I've never gotten off to a start this bad. Have I had stretches that were this bad? I'm sure I have. But not at the beginning when you're sitting there looking at your results and you're saying, what the f- am I going to do about this? And so that's one of the biggest things I think for me is that, you know, this is a results-based business and I fully understand that. But one of the things that we've always tried to do on Bang the Book Radio or in the write-ups over at bangthebook.com is we've always tried to set you up with the process because I'm a big believer in a process that works for you, getting closing line value, getting out there in front of the market. Those things are going to help you. You know, the results come and go. There's so much variance in the results. But if you've got the right process and the right mindset, then it's something that should work out for you. And we've always preached that here. And I always have to force myself to remember that during this baseball season, just because the results have gotten off to such a bad start. So that's the thing. You know, make sure that you're making bets that you can justify. Make sure that you're making bets that you would make again. Make sure that you're going through your process, that you're evaluating all the information that's out there, that you're taking advantage of the different resources that are there, and the results should come. Hopefully for me, the results do start to come. Uh, That would be very, very nice, obviously. And turning over to the month of May, uh, you know, will hopefully be something that benefits me. But again, I mean, this is such a a marathon type of thing. You know, with a small sample size, you could be up 30%, you could be down 30%. It's where you are at the end of all of it that you really want to focus on. So Trying to keep the big picture in mind is, is very important advice that I've been given here with this slow start to the season. All right, let's go beyond the box score here. Let's start with that Indians and Astros series. The Indians and the Astros did split that series. You know, the Indians are not making a whole lot of hard contact here this season. They did wind up with 31 batted balls of 95 plus miles per hour. They got better over the course of the weekend, uh, which does make sense. I mean, you know, Jose Ramirez is starting to see a little bit better. Francisco Lindor back in the lineup. Carlos Gonzalez. You know, getting his feet under him. So it does make a little bit of sense that the Indians should get a little bit better day by day by day. But, you know, the Astros, they only had 33 batted balls of 95-plus miles per hour after having 12 of them in the first game on Thursday night. They had 11 of them alone off of Trevor Bauer. They were 2 for 11 on that high-velocity contact. Uh, they were 13 for 33 overall. The Indians were 16 for 31. The Indians hit three home runs under 95 miles per hour of exit velocity. There were 21 to that point, uh, and then they hit three of them here in this series. And you know, they're not hitting for power. They're not hitting a lot of high-quality contact, not a lot of high-velocity contact. I do wonder how long they can keep this all up. Now, that being said, the offense should get a little bit better as we move forward here. You know, as they get uh, some more Francisco Lindor plate appearances, as they get some guys you know, back in the swing of things, they should get a little bit better. But right now, this offense is pretty bad. They're heading down to Miami this week. I think both of those games are under candidates. Um, you know, it's just not a good offensive team right now. They're lucky to be where they are, truthfully, uh, with the starting pitching, with how well the bullpen has performed. And, you know, as I was watching the Astros in this series, they're a really, really good team. Uh, but, you know, again, I mean, it's one of those things where they're very right-handed heavy. Uh, you know, they're going to have to burn out some of their relievers that are pitching really well because they've got some guys in the bullpen right now they just are not getting the job done on a regular basis. Chris Davinsky allowed a lot of hard contact. Josh James is completely unusable. Will Harris has been very inconsistent. They're going to have to burn out Ryan Presley and Roberto Ozuna here during the regular – or Osuna during the regular season uh, if they get challenged in the West. Right now, there are no challenges for them. Uh, but in watching them here in this series, I, I'm finding that maybe there are some spots that we can look to go against them. Hopefully, we can use those to our advantage here as the season goes along. Speaking of high-velocity contact, how about the New York Yankees? In that series against the Giants, they had 52 batted balls of 95-plus miles per hour. In that series against the Giants, plus Thursday's game against the Anaheim Angels, 52 batted balls of 95-plus miles per hour. They wind up sweeping the Giants. The Giants only had 25 of them. Yankees with 24 runs in those three games, 6-1 and one on this trip, going to two pitchers' parks. And they've scored at least five runs in every game. 
I don't know how the hell they're doing it with this patchwork lineup full of journeymen and call-ups, but you know, they're, they're just, uh, they're getting it done. And it's been very impressive to see their pitchers have done really well in these favorable pitchers parks. Also Uh, kudos to them. You know, I mean, it's just not something that anybody expected with all the injuries that they had, but they've been very, very good offensively here on this road trip. They're off today. They'll be in Arizona tomorrow. The Rockies took two out of three from the Atlanta Braves. Rockies with 41 at bats with a runner in scoring position in this series. The offense has gotten it going as I predicted. Of course, I wasn't too involved in this series. I wish I would have been. They were a bullpen blow up away from a sweep, but the Braves offense also very good. Unders are going to be so scary this year, just overall. You know, bullpen blowups, so many of those. Um, offenses just league-wide seem to be doing so much better. Both of these offenses showed up pretty well in this Rockies and Braves series. But the Rockies, again, really the big takeaway there is that I predicted that they would come around offensively. They did. I wish I would have been more involved with some overs. wish I would have played that John Gray, Mike fulton Evich over. Uh, but, you know, again, uh, you know, this is another one of those examples where – even the teams that are doing really bad will eventually regress toward the league average. The Rockies were one of them here, and they're starting to have a lot more success on their high-velocity contact and just in general. How about the Toronto Blue Jays sweeping the Oakland A's here? Speaking of a bullpen blow-up, a huge one for Blake Trainin in yesterday's game for Oakland. The Jays still look like a fade team, though. That's my primary takeaway from this series. They are a low on-base percentage lineup. They have a high batting average on balls in play with runners in scoring position. I think there could be some fool's gold, so to speak, in their prices here in the short term. They get that sweep of Oakland. An Oakland team that, you know, on paper looks really strong, but they're not playing well right now at all whatsoever. The Vlad Guerrero Jr. call up, uh, Stroman pitching really well, Sanchez shutting down the A's again. I think we can fade Toronto here in the near future. I think I will look to do that here this week, probably on into next week as well, looking for opportunities to go against the Blue Jays because I don't think that they're nearly as good as they're playing right now. And we're going to have some very good opportunities to go against them in the near future with some recency bias leaking into the market with their prices. All right, let's take a look down the lines here. Talk about some line moves dating back to Friday. We saw Max Scherzer money come in. He went up 25 or more cents against the Padres. Good dog winner here for the Padres backers. We were on Washington minus half a run for the first five. That came through. Then they gave up the lead and then uh, eventually lost the game late. It's hard to fade the Padres for the full game because that bullpen is just so strong. So, so strong. You get the Padres at big dog prices here for the full game. They may be worth some investment just because their bullpen will protect the lead if they get one and keep it close if they don't have one. So that will give their offense an opportunity against the bullpens that are out there. And as I just mentioned, a lot of bad bullpens out there in baseball right now. So the Padres at inflated Big balloon prices as an underdog may be worth playing because their bullpen is going to be better than the opposition bullpen in just about every game that they play with the way that things look right now. So about a 30 cent move against Colin McHugh in the Indians Astros game there on Friday. It seemed like a high number. The Indians didn't get a lot of respect in the opening lines throughout that series. Money came in on them in the Bauer game on them in the Kluber game on them in the uh, Carrasco Miley game on Sunday night. A lot of this has to do with the fact that their offense grades so poorly that they probably didn't deserve the respect against Houston. Now we'll see how things look going forward here for them as they start playing some lesser competition once again. The Royals took money on Friday, and they've been taking quite a bit of money here lately. Uh, I'm not looking to back the Royals in any context, but they've been taking some funds here in recent weeks. Saw a big move against the Mariners and Yusei Kikuchi, and that was one where I think the odds makers fell asleep a little bit. I didn't write about this game. I had something to get to Friday uh, late morning around lunchtime. So I didn't touch on this game either. I wish I would have so everyone was aware of it. But Kikuchi is going to be scheduled for some one-inning starts here over the course of the season. The Mariners want to lower and limit his workload because it's a much more strenuous schedule than pitching over in Japan. The difference is they want to keep him on his regular turn. So Kikuchi in that game only threw nine pitches, struck out two batters, that was it for his day. Just as Sheffield came in, gave up, I think, three or four runs over three and two-thirds or something like that. Uh, so that was one where Kikuchi was only going to pitch one inning. Then it was going to be a bullpen game for the Mariners, and uh, you know, they didn't really have much success with their bullpen over the weekend uh, by any means. So that was an interesting one there where they did pick up the win, uh, but Kikuchi only threw one inning. 
and the market poured in on the Rangers, and probably deservedly so. Saturday, we saw a fade of Dakota Hudson and the Cardinals. I think we should see Reds money fairly regularly here in the short term. This offense cannot be this bad for this much longer. They're doing awful on balls in play. They're doing awful on high-velocity contact. Uh, they should get some more opportunities. They draw a, they don't draw a high number of walks. They do have some guys at the top of the order that do draw some walks. I think the Reds should get better here offensively in the near term, and money came in on them against Dakota Hudson on Saturday. I uh, saw another Angels opener to screw up the market on Saturday. The Angels keep doing that with the openers, and eventually we're not even going to get overnight lines with the Angels, and, and who knows? I mean, they're not even announcing these early, like Ryan Stanek and the Rays or something like that. They're just announcing it mid-afternoon. Uh, they weren't supposed to be able to do this with what's going on with Major League Baseball and its partnerships regarding sports gambling, uh, but they are still doing it. So, you know, another opener there on Saturday, and we'll see if they keep using this opener concept as they go forward. Flip favorite between the Rangers and the Mariners. That was the right call. That was Mike Leak on the hill for the Mariners. He's awful. T-Mobile Park's playing pretty small as well. Uh, the Rangers hammering the Mariners here on Saturday and Sunday uh, as, you know, they got the offense going a little bit there against Mike Leak and then on Eric Swanson on Sunday. So money come in on Jay Happ in a good road park on Saturday against the Giants. That makes sense. Happ is a very good guy in good road parks. We'll see how he fares at Yankee Stadium as we go forward here. Sunday, we saw some Padres money on Joey Lucchese. They got bet into favorites. It's the Washington Nationals and Jeremy Hellickson. Uh, that was one where the Nationals actually did outlast the Padres there in the late innings. So a little bit of a sale fade for the Boston and Tampa Bay game on Sunday. Sale was better. Still wasn't great, though. Uh, we saw money on Matt Boyd once again on Sunday. That just keeps happening over and over again. So a fade of Wade Miley on Sunday Night Baseball. Uh, again, that's a thing that's been happening with frequency as well with money coming in against Wade Miley and the Astros in his starts. On Monday here, we're seeing some Cardinals money hit the board against Patrick Corbin and the Washington Nationals. That's interesting to me. The Cardinals don't hit lefties. They haven't hit lefties for a long time. Uh, Michael Walker has been very up and down this year. Interesting line move. There are a lot of people out there that don't trust the Nationals. I'm among them. I don't trust their bullpen either. So, you know, for some full games, we probably will keep seeing money come in against Washington. I didn't take it today. Uh, but a pretty interesting one there. See the Braves getting bet into a bigger favorite against the Padres. That's Nick Margavicious and Mike Soroka. Uh, Soroka getting that buzz. Saw money come in on him last week. Also, the Padres taking on a tough righty. Not really a great spot for them. So the Milwaukee line moved down. Now it's come back up with some buyback out there. That's Kyle Freeland going up against Zach Davies. And that one, Freeland coming off the DL, had a blood blister under his broken fingernail. Uh, they took care of that. Now he's making the start here tonight against Milwaukee. And this is one of those where when Milwaukee faces a left-handed pitcher at home, money will come in on the Brewers. Uh, I'm not too worried about it in particular here today because Kyle Freeland, not your average run-of-the-mill lefty, uh, but that will be a thing that we do see, much like we see Oakland money come in when they face lefty at home. My pick for Monday night, going to throw a big old dog at you here, the Minnesota Twins over the Houston Astros. Astros going from warm Houston to much cooler Minneapolis. I got a little bit of a shock to the system here. And also, look, we talk about trying to find situational spots in baseball. I think this is one. Houston goes from playing the Indians in a long four-game series, a lot of trash talk, a lot of high-level baseball. Then they go and take on the Twins. And the Twins are a very hot team here over the last two weeks. They've hit the most home runs in baseball. The offense has gotten going as the weather has gotten better. I think Houston overlooks Minnesota a little bit in this series. They fared pretty decent against them at home last week. I think they overlooked them in this series, and specifically tonight, Minnesota hitting home runs, as I mentioned. The one knock on Justin Verlander is the long ball. I think it's a good spot here for the Minnesota Twins as a big dog at home with Jake Odorizzi on the mound outside there at Target Field. I'll take the Twins tonight in the plus 155 range against the Houston Astros. All right, so what am I looking at here for the week ahead? Well, let's start up in Beantown, where the A's take on the Red Sox. The A's offense in the tank lately. Bullpen's been very inconsistent. Red Sox can't get their offense going. Let's see if they do it here in this series. Frankie Montas, Eduardo Rodriguez tonight. Aaron Brooks, Rick Porcello tomorrow. Mike Fires and Hector Velasquez on Wednesday. I think this is a good chance for the Red Sox to get that offense going. I've been talking about looking for the spots to play on the Red Sox. I got the over in the article tonight. And taking on 
Aaron Brooks and Mike Fires, a Mike Fires guy who's been awful on the road this season and really throughout most of his career. Uh, some good chances for the Red Sox here. I think this could be that offensive breakout for Boston in this series. Again, have a piece of the over tonight. We'll see what Tuesday and Wednesday have in store for us. The Astros and the Twins, as I mentioned, Justin Verlander, Jake Odorizzi tonight, Garrett Cole, Michael Pineda tomorrow, Colin McHugh, Martin Perez on Wednesday, Brad Peacock, Jose Barrios on Thursday. Back-to-back four-game series here for Houston. You know, I think I like Minnesota a little bit in this series, possibly take a look at them for the series price, which wouldn't encompass all four games, only the first three games here. But they got to collect some data last week against Houston. And the Twins are very progressive front office now. I gain new emphasis on data could lead to good things for them in this series. And as this season goes along, I think that has something to do with how their offense has perked up a little bit too. The weather certainly has had an impact, but I think this twins team just gets smarter. Their pitchers get smarter and more efficient as the season goes along. I don't think we talk enough about how good this Minnesota offense is. They're third and weighted on base average against right-handed pitching. They get four of them in this series. They're top five against lefties as well. I like this Twins offense a substantial amount. They're probably going to end up being the team to beat in the AL Central this year. I'm going to go ahead and make that call now. I love the Indians. I love the starting staff. The bullpen will get much better as the season goes along because of all the reinforcements they have in the bullpen. I just don't know when this offense is going to wake up. And the Twins, I think, will progressively get better as the year goes along. I love their offense. I like them here in this series against the Astros. Should be able to get a good pro, uh, good plus money price on them for the first three games here in this series, especially taking on Verlander and Garrett Cole. And I, I wasn't overly impressed with Garrett Cole and his start there on Thursday night. Not great control with the fastball. Uh, kind of overthrowing a little bit, it felt like. Uh, maybe he's a little bit vulnerable here in this start as he goes outside against the Twins. I don't know, but I think it, that one may be worth taking that big plus money price on Minnesota for the first three games of this series here. The Rockies and the Brewers, Kyle Freeland and Zach Davies tonight, Herman Marquez, Ulysses Chassin on Tuesday, Antonio Senzatella, Tyler, or excuse me, Chase Anderson on Wednesday, John Gray, Brandon Woodruff on Thursday. Miller Park's playing real small this year, uh, over 11 runs per game in the 14 games here at Miller Park. The Rockies offense has gotten back on track. The Brewers offense has stalled out a little bit. Christian Yelich leaving that game yesterday with the back discomfort. Craig Council said he was going to sit tonight. We'll see if that becomes a multiple-day thing. It probably should with how he's carrying the offense, but uh, that'll be something for you to keep in mind on Tuesday night where Marquez should take money. I would get out in front of that line move there and take Herman Marquez on the overnights. The market does not like Euless Chassin, and also if Christian Yelich is not in the lineup for the Brewers, that line's going to move even more throughout the day. So, I would grab Herman Marquez tonight on the overnights. Expect that line to move down. If Yelich is out, that line will move down even further. And we could have some line value there on Marquez in that start against the Brewers. The Padres and the Braves here. Padres' fewest number of play appearances with a runner in scoring position this season. So that's why they've had so many problems here in the first five. Nick Margovicius, Mike Soroka tonight. Chris Paddock, Julio Tehran tomorrow. Uh, Matt Strom and Max Fried on Wednesday. Eric Lauer and Mike fulton on Thursday. These matchups aren't as bad for the first five for the Padres as they usually are. Maybe they can get to Tehran on Tuesday. Lefty on Wednesday, which should benefit them. Then Mike fulton with his second start back on Thursday. I think we could see some runs in this series, in particular in the first five. Uh, I think the, Obviously, the Padres' bullpen is something you don't want to F with too much. Uh, but I think we could see some runs here in the early going of this series. Finally, a handful of other regression or fade camps to take a look at here. John Lester in Seattle on Wednesday. I would be stunned if I don't have a Mariners ticket on Wednesday. That's John Lester going up against uh, Marco Gonzalez. Extra hitter in the lineup for Seattle. A lot of good right-handed bats at the top. I think it's a good spot to fade John Lester on Wednesday. Also, the Reds and Mets over Tuesday could be interesting to me here. Uh, Luis Castillo, I think, is a little bit of a fade candidate now. I think he's a little overpriced, a little overrated. Mets have a pretty decent lineup. Not a great hitter's park, obviously, but that should keep this total down. Can the Reds hit Jason Vargas is the question. The Reds have to hit somebody here at some point. They're too talented of an offense to keep doing what they're doing. So maybe the Reds-Mets over in tomorrow's article could wind up being a play for me. 
We'll have a Kentucky Derby show either Tuesday or Wednesday here this week with Brian Blessing. Also talk about the Kentucky Oaks and some of the other races on the card. Then also we'll be back on Thursday with another edition of the Betters Box. And then Friday, we'll chat with Christian Pina about this week's UFC event. So do it for me. Thank you so much for listening, everybody. And remember that you'll never strike out when you're in the Betters Box.